So why don't we start? So today we're very happy to welcome Dr. Sabrina gonzalez Pasterski. She received an undergraduate degree from MIT in 2013, a PhD in physics from Harvard in 2019, and she's currently a postdoctoral researcher at Princeton Center for Theoretical Science. Dr. Pastewski's research interests span quantum gravity, string theory, holography, black hole physics, and quantum information theory. So today she will tell us about building celestial holography. So Sabrina, take it away. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, so yeah, so today I'm happy to be talking about um, a developing a fun research program that we call lovingly celestial holography. Um, and so um, for the talk, um, because especially with like this broader audience, I'm going to focus on this, the starting point that was building up to it. And basically the, like the this sense in which we're trying to like build connections to other subfields and uh, the ingredients that go into finding this holographic dual for scattering in, um, in Minkowski space or space times that have vanishing cosmological constant. And we'll get to that next. So let's talk about the big picture questions that I guess are motivating um, this, this research line. And um, there are three of them here. So the first one is we want to understand fundamental laws obeyed by nature. And for us, that would mean like, what are its symmetries? Um, what consistency conditions can you impose? Um, that would basically tell you whether or not some postulated interaction is consistent or not, or some S matrix. Um, the second big question is basically what would happen at um, energy scales we can't yet probe in experiments. And then also there's fun thought experiments about um, say, especially someone interested in quantum gravity, what happens when you fall into a black hole? So let's, uh, what I, basically the, the, the point I'm advocating here is that as a high energy theorist, I'm looking for some consistency conditions or ways to find more consistency conditions that can ideally tie into future experiments, saying something about high energy physics um, or thought experiments, fun stuff about what would happen um, in experiments you hopefully do not want to actually implement, um, and that these would feed back into uh, more consistency conditions. So ideally, the, the, the aim for today is to describe this program that's trying to find uh, or starts from a nice route that pushes for more um, rules obeyed by uh, scattering with gravity. Um, and then uh, it's led to some more fun uh, possible consistency conditions, which could say something about amplitudes, as well as some also this, these questions about uh, what happens when you fall into a black hole. You can, you can push them in both directions. So we will try to get to each of these fun overarching themes in this talk. Great. OK, so the hurdle. So the main um, problem, I guess, if you're someone in high energy theory who likes quantum gravity, would be that we know that at very large distance scales, uh, the universe is well described by um, general relativity. And then at very short distances, we also have, like, we've done a lot technologically with quantum mechanics. And so when you try to merge the two, you fun into uh, various pitfalls. So the first naive thing would be to treat it like uh, a field theory, and then you see that it's not normalizable, and you can try to find ways around that. You also run into inconsistencies if you just try to say, like, okay, I have this like, curved background and I do quantum field theory on top of it. Um, but then you find that, that there's this like evaporating black holes will like end up making the system not unitary. You have information paradox. So there's lots of just like subtle issues, I guess, coming into how you think that you should be able to just blend these two descriptions of the world. So the hope for, I guess, what's motivating this research line is that there are kind of two, I guess, alternative approaches to try to tackle this problem. So perhaps the most, um, flashy and fun uh, way to go for the problem is to go right to the UV and try to say that there's something that we're missing. So whether or not, first of all, beyond the standard model physics, like you, you're, you're probing um, with uh, mathematical consistencies, what will happen at scales that you can't see yet, but then it's basically changing the paradigm at very short distance scales so that you get around these issues of number normalizability. So say there's some sort of string theory or alternate model there. And what I want to advocate here in this talk is that there's also uh, possible fruits that you can reap from going to large distances and understanding all of the symmetries that are basically intrinsic to the asymptotic structure of your spacetime. And so the so the MO here would be on the one hand, this is like coming up with some new theory in the UV and then trying to see what um, that implies for theories that you'd see in, in daily life or at like a normal distance scales. 
And so that's a very high energy theory down approach. And us, we're trying to build up from the bottom. We're saying, we know that we're in three plus one D or you can, you can change that if you, if you wanted to be more creative. Um, and we know that basically for a very large range of scattering experiments, it's approximately valid to say that the cosmological constant is zero. So if we just start from that starting point, there are actually a large number of symmetries that will act on our scattering procedure and basically impose um, more constraints on scattering. So essentially what we're gonna try to do is start from what you could compute in perturbation theory, treating gravity as a field theory, and, and the same thing, we can do use similar stuff for gauge theories. And you'll find that there's um, actually a symmetry enhancement compared to the global symmetries that we, we're used to. So the, the MO there is then to apply Noether's theorem, more symmetries gives you more constraints, and you can hopefully say something powerful about um, gravitational scattering, because now we're saying the whole quantum theory is constrained. So that's, that's the, the logic there. Okay, so the plan for this talk is to introduce the framework, which is trying to reorganize like the scattering problem. So you prepare some um, um, initial states and then scatter to some final states. We want to basically take that machinery and just basically do some sort of transformation on it in a way that makes manifest um, these infinite dimensional symmetry enhancements that I was hinting at before. And then the idea there is that these infinite dimensional or infinite number of symmetries basically reorganize amplitudes into um, something that looks like conformal field theory correlators. So what we're gonna motivate now, I'm gonna go into more details on what each of these things are, is that basically you have two toolkits now that you can try to like cross over. So you have a lot of success recently in, in amplitudes, just like, like finding what consistent, uh, consistency conditions you can impose on, on your scattering. And then also there's a lot of algebraic um, machinery you have available once you have a conformal field theory. So basically by putting the symmetries front and center, you can start using two different languages to describe this, this problem we're attacking. And that's the theme of, of celestial holography. So part one of the talk is going to be basically where these symmetries are coming from. And I'm gonna actually spend most of my time on that because I think that's the most um, visceral and visualizable aspect of, of the stuff. And then part two is going to say how we would learn from um, where the structure of these symmetries that we see to talk about how we would um, maybe change a basis for scattering um, and basically take us um, to, uh, to to see what, where we would be able to basically apply these two different toolkits to the problem that we're interested in from the beginning. So let's get to part one. And I'm also happy to take questions at any point too. Um, so, so definitely feel free. So celestial holography, let's maybe say why we're naming it such. And so um, the first thing to keep in mind is that the thing that we're studying is the S matrix. So S is scattering matrix. So what happens is I have um, this overlap between, I prepare some in state and then I let my system evolve and then I get out some out state. And I would use this S matrix element to compute quantum mechanical probabilities by squaring it. And, um, and so, at first, I'm going to start like with the things that we're um, starting from is like the perturbative S matrix, but ideally we want this to describe the full um, quantum gravitational scattering. So basically what I have here now is I have for my very early and very late times, a bunch of particles that are on shell. So their, um, their momentum squared is equal to their mass. And um, whatever's happening in the interactions here is something complicated, but there should be symmetries that um, the system obeys, which will constrain those interactions. Now, when I talk about scattering, an important aspect of it is that I want to not just talk about um, like the standard model, but I want to also include gravity. Now, once you include gravity, you have this holographic principle, which is a which postulates that a theory of quantum gravity um, is going to have or be, be equivalent to a lower dimensional theory uh, without gravity. And so, often these lower dimensional theories, the reason why it's called CFT, is not only do you have like your normal like um, isometries, but also conformal isometries. So you basically can rescale uh, different uh, patches of, of your, your field theory. But the key ingredient is basically it's it's going to be not the same number of space-time dimensions as the, the bulk theory with quantum gravity. So it's somehow a theory at the boundary. Um, and that the, um, the it, it's in more like standard um, quantum field theory at the boundary. So now that you don't have gravity at the boundary, um, you can apply the techniques that like you avoid the roadblocks I was talking about at the beginning of, of, the, of the talk. So essentially what the reason for naming it as such is that we're trying to apply the holographic principle 
to uh, space times of vanishing cosmological constant. And part of the motivation for this program is also that there has been success uh, within um, space times with, say, negative cosmological constant. Uh, you can um, find explicit examples of such a duality in, using string theory. Um, and then also just even looking at black hole physics, the fact that the entropy of this black hole is scaling like the horizon area as opposed to some volume is kind of also giving you this hint that gravity is somehow like, like lower dimensional than it appeared. So this program is going to be applying um, the holographic principle to the S matrix. Uh, and is basically the, the first name celestial is just because of where it's going to lie. So it's going to be slightly different form than maybe examples of holography you might be used to. So this co-dimensionality is going to be different instead of it being just a 1D lower boundary. We're going to think of scattering in 3 plus 1, like the, the world that we see, as somehow living on the night sky. So that's the celestial. And then the holography is that we're basically creating objects that are defined at the boundary, which then um, computes scattering in the bulk, when the bulk being the space time that we live in. Good. OK, so part one of the talk, secrets in the infrared. So the way that um, this is motivated is essentially like, so, so, so for instance, um, why would we maybe want to go for this approach? So the first step you might take if you really did say that there is some um, boundary dual to, to your scattering is to say, what are the symmetries on both sides? So if you have a, an equivalence, you want to match the symmetries. Um, and so the first part of the talk is going to be talking about what the symmetries are and then where this dual lives. So the celestial part of, of the, the name attached to this. And what we're going to find is that the S matrix, so like if you just take this, the scattering matrix as a couple to gravity, so perturbative um, gravitational scattering, you're going to see that it obeys an infinite dimensional symmetry enhancement of Poincaré. And then similar things happen in other gauge theories. So this enhancement is going to be a universal uh, feature of, of basically low energy radiation. That's what we'll talk about in the following slides. And the other aspect is that the dual will naturally live on the celestial sphere. So we're going to get the first part of the name for the program, as well as basically why, why it's interesting. So the, the interesting thing about it, so in the end, we're taking an object that people study all the time, and we're recasting it because we know that there are these infinite number of symmetries that are somehow normally hidden in, um, in, in, in infrared physics, which I'll talk about. So that this is like the first part of the talk and basically the main motivation and also the, um, the, the, the most um, experimentally relevant aspect of it so far, because basically the question of what symmetries you have is intimately tied in with what you can go out and observe with some say space-based gravitational wave detector, for example. So hopefully those elements will be um, emphasized in this part. Okay, so. Let's start with um, what the arena is that we're talking about for scattering. So I want to consider space times with vanishing cosmological constant and localized stress tensors. So the official name that would be attached to this would be called asymptotically flat space time. And the reason is as follows. So I have um, no longer, I'm, I'm no longer actually flat, but I have these localized matter stress sensor sources, but somehow in the large, it looks flat. Now in the 1960s, Bondi, sorry, the, I, Vandenberg, Metzner, and Sachs were quantifying what it means to be um, asymptotically flat. And so what it means in practice is that instead of this metric just being your Minkowski metric, there is some um, basically large R falloffs. And so like the first approximation is, you know, the Newtonian gravitational field. And then of course um, it's all GR and whatnot. So you have essentially one over R falloffs associated with some um, class of matter distributions that you're allowing. And in the end, you have no cosmological constant. So those are the, the two ingredients there. So what I want to point out are where these large number of symmetries can come from. Like, how do you have an infinite number more symmetries than maybe you're used to having? Um, is that, well, if you demand that the metric stays invariant under whatever diffeomorphism, so like map of, uh, of your space time to itself, you're going to not have basically any at some point. So first, you have Poincaré when you actually have Minkowski space. You can like, do special relativity and, and whatnot. But once you add some mass distribution sitting there, now it's no longer the same configuration unless, say you have one particle, you can rotate around it. Maybe you can time translate, but you're not gonna have this full set of isometries. Now, the funny thing about it is once you go to the limit where you have basically no isometries because you have just a bunch of matter sitting there, the thing that you want to preserve isn't actually 
keeping the metric the same, but keeping the class of metrics the same. And so that's where you have this chance of having a large number of symmetries. Okay, so let's, for the sake of not getting too technical in the sense that I like, I'll try to avoid as many, um, like avoid Penrose diagrams and, and as equations as possible. Um, the, the procedure that one would go about to identify the asymptotic symmetry group of a space time is as follows. So first step is you want to pick a gauge. You don't want to, um, you want to have a good well-defined scattering problem. So you want to be able to define your initial data and then evolve it forward to some final data and, and not have um, gauge degrees of freedom, which can be time dependent there. So you pick a gauge and Bondi van der Rugg, Mr. and Sachs's gauge is called Bondi gauge. And um, you can, we can go into why, why that gauge is nice. But the important thing is once you've picked a gauge, you then try to determine what physically relevant boundary conditions you want in that gauge. And so essentially, if you had something, it's a Goldilocks type problem. If you have something that doesn't fall off fast enough, then you might have like infinite energy. If you have something that falls off too fast, then you exclude radiation. So it's a delicate balance between um, talking about what, um, what solutions you, you want to allow and which ones um, you end up getting. So you want to think about the problem as saying, if I start with matter distributions, like formally you would want to look at, like does this set of boundary conditions stay closed under the time evolution under GR or whatnot? So there's like a math side of that literature. Um, and then there's also just the, the physical intuition side where say, I know that if I have a point charge in the electromagnetic example, it's going to have a Coulomb field that's like one over R squared and it radiates is going to have a one over R radiative field. Essentially those one over R falloffs are building into these boundary conditions. Now, once you have those boundary conditions, you go about and look at the gauge transformations you can do. So the residual gauge transformations that are still somehow left over after you've tried to gauge fix as much as possible are um, much smaller in number than the original gauge symmetry that you have. So normally you'd have like for translations for free functions of, of your, your space-time coordinates say. Now you've gauge fixed, so you've gotten rid of basically like one of the coordinate dependences there. And you have now basically some residual class that you can't actually get rid of as seen as, seen as follows. So somehow if I say my um, diffeomorphisms are basically like changing my coordinate system very far away. So if you try to fix your coordinate system and then some gravitational wave passes and your particles move, there's a sense in which um, like that net change of your positions is somehow um, would be hard to I guess, specify. The gauge that you'd fix would be a bit uh, a causal. Like I mean, like you'd have to. The way you'd fix it is somehow relative to reference time or formally, like uh, very early on. So formally, you can try to remove these these large gauge degrees of freedom. But my um, the, the point I'm trying to make here is that it's good not to. And um, when you don't do that, you have this non-trivial phase space for the soft sector. And it has fun implications for, for like when you also have boundaries at the horizon, et cetera. So there's a lot there to go into. But the thing I want to emphasize from this slide is you can kind of see the, the order of how you would go about finding these guys and that the global symmetries are going to be a lot smaller than these asymptotic symmetries because these asymptotic symmetries aren't maybe as restrictive as global symmetries. And also the fact that you can't fully pin down uh, your, your, the, the fall offs of the metric because you're just staying within a class of metrics. So. Again, the difference here is that you have, say, one particular solution, the Minkowski space vacuum, that these guys preserve versus you have a class. And so this can be much larger. And then the other fun thing about it for maybe condensed matter folks is that essentially the dynamics of these like low energy modes is described by the spontaneously, like the fact that these symmetries get spontaneously broken down to the global ones. So you basically now have a bunch of um, like th there's different ways of seeing the story. On the one side, you think of this as the fact that um, you have uh, somehow what we'll talk about next, low energy radiative uh, effects. And then on the other side, there's also more formally, you can think of um, like an effective theory for these modes. So there's a lot of fun stuff just in this soft sector. And what I want to emphasize now is that these large distance behaviors are actually related to soft physics. So that's um, what I'm going to motivate next. Okay. so. I'm going to try to stick to an example so that in case I blabber too much, at least we can we can stick back to something that that should be um, easy to visualize. So the first example I'm going to talk about is just the electromagnetic case. And there, like in the end, what I want to point out is that these um, these symmetries that I'm talking about are going to be tied into uh, low energy radiation. And so for the electromagnetic case, the gauge fixing is essentially now 
um, like you have your, your AMU and you fix like a, a nice gauge for it. And then the fall offs are, what are the fall offs for these, these fields? So um, basically what I have here is I have my charge and Coulomb's law tells me that whenever I have this charge, I'm going to have some electromagnetic field around it. So already if you were very, very naive setting up your scattering problem and said, I'm just gonna scatter some charges and never talk about any photons attached to it, that's a problem because we know that the charged particle has an electromagnetic field. And not only does it have that field, it also will um, produce radiation when it accelerates. So what's fun about it is that basically, you can see this picture of if you have some scattering process and say you don't even have any particle um, production, you just have something colliding and then coming out. The fact that the kinematics of uh, that charge moving asymptotically say initially with one momenta and then that changing implies that there's been some radiation, like there has to be some radiation according to the constraint equations or just Leonard Beckard, like accelerating charge solutions. So if I'm sitting very far away, I can measure that radiation uh, via this test charge, which will receive a kick. And so what I want to basically now point out is that if I wanted to connect um, some scattering procedure that I'm going to compute with, say, Feynman diagrams and what I would see in the space time, um, I, can, I can think about it as follows. So I imagine like thinking about a large sphere surrounding my scattering process. And then if my test charge is sitting, say, near the North Pole, and there's some scattering process, it will be basically measuring um, radiation that comes towards it. So the momentum of that, um, of that photon will be towards the direction of my test mass. So basically, what I'm arguing right now is that if I have a computation I can do in momentum space with the standard like S matrix amplitude stuff, then I know how to basically connect what I'm saying about low energy radiation from the amplitude side to the fact that I'm sitting somewhere on this sphere far away and I'm sitting in the direction basically where that radiation is going. So you have that. Now, the other input here is that basically when I take the analog of Gauss's law for um, what amounts to being um, pushing up the, the slice at which I'm like evaluating those constraints to go to a limit where essentially now this boundary is null and I don't wanna go too far into to, um, to like the, the, the causal structure of Minkowski space. But basically what I wanna say is that there is an analog of Gauss's law that instead of saying that the, the net charge, um, like the, the electric field surrounding a charge is, is like what you would expect, like the, the, the total flux is equal to the charge up to some four pi's, um, that instead you basically get a constraint saying that the initial and final kinematics of the charges is related to a time integral of the radiation. And roughly speaking, that's intuitive from the fact that if you um, accelerate the charge, if the radiation is proportional to the acceleration, then the time integral of the acceleration is the change in velocities. And my initial and final states are prepared with definite velocities. So there's some constraints that tell you that this low energy radiation, because basically I'm time integrating, so time integral becomes low energy, is in a given direction where I'm sitting where my test mass is, uh, is basically, um, is related to what's happening in the scattering process where I emit the particle in that direction at very low energies. So I have a space time picture of me sitting somewhere far away and being accelerated by or kicked around by a scattering process happening. And then I have the picture where I can compute that in the amplitude. And so the reason why those two elements of it are important is because they're tied into each other in the following way. So the fact that I can go out and um, measure this kick in my test charge it would be a memory effect. Well, the fact that I can go and say that there's this universal relation between having this, like this very low energy, like the fact that I can compute the, um, the amplitude with one of the particles being a gauge field going very, very low energy, that fact that is computable very simply in quantum field theory because of so-called soft theorems. So there's some machinery within quantum field theory that gives you out um, a nice answer as far as the fact that like that extra photon or extra graviton is basically proportional to the amplitude without it. So it's almost like you're measuring, um, you're measuring that low energy radiation. And moreover, um, the fact that I was kind of alluding to before with like how these asymptotic symmetries are um, related to the fact that I can can't really fully fix gauge fix because at some point radiation is gonna pass and I'm gonna transition between things. So that also ties in. Basically what happens is the following. So there are some low energy observable that I'm gonna call a memory effect, which I'm gonna try to explain about how it it's slightly different than um, what you would normally say, like an energy deposition type detector. Um, and that memory effect with this picture I was drawing with the scattering process and the sphere surrounding it 
is related to um, the soft theorem I can compute in quantum field theory. And then uh, basically the symplectic pairing in the space space is to this pure gauge mode, which is this asymptotic symmetry. So you have this triangle of relations. And what I want to emphasize with the interesting part of this is that it's a pattern and you can do multiple iterations of this to try to find new physics. So for me, the most interesting example of this is one where each of the vertices was basically brand new. And that's the one that's gonna motivate going to celestial holography. So let's uh, take a moment to think about the gravitational version of these things because the electromagnetic case is easier for visualizing the fact that yes, you have this charged particle, yes, it's going to accelerate. And yes, the, the radiation basically falls off slower than the Coulomb field. And that somehow I see that when I'm sitting far away. And if I time integrate that, then I'm seeing like the change in the kinematics. So all those elements are kind of clear there. But in the gravitational case, it's perhaps more interesting because um, I guess there's somehow like more, um, the, this triangle of relations is tying in also basically very old um, research adventures um, that may or may not have excluded certain symmetries and whatnot. So let's, let's point towards this. So one thing nice about the, the setup with scattering is that if I assume that their cosmological constant is vanishing, I can at least describe physics at a very wide range of scales. So when I talk about asymptotic symmetries, there's some approximation in which the, um, like say around CMS, like wherever the, de the detector is sitting, that that is at infinity compared to the scattering process that's happening in the center where the collision occurs. Similarly, if I think about um, LIGO or some other space based uh, future version of LIGO, um, you can think about like some in spiraling binary system emitting gravitational waves and then that moving my detector around. And that will also hopefully <laughs> capture memory effects. So on the one hand at CERN, you want to maybe look at the analog of memory effects for um, for say heavy ion collisions, maybe not at CERN, um, for, for, for gluons. And at, at a future space-based gravitational wave detector, you can try to basically measure uh, energy and angular momentum flux through your detector and say something about now um, the relevance of certain asymptotic symmetry. So that's the, the key point, is that you have an experimental way to tell you whether or not you want to um, add symmetries to your, your story in some sense. Okay. And this, it ultimately boils down to the fact that you have this Goldilocks type of scenario where like, if I change my boundary conditions, then I have changed my symmetry group, but the boundary conditions are tied into what is physically realistic. And of course, if I like look at cosmological scales or somehow the matter distributions aren't maybe what I was assuming, those will change things. So it's a delicate kind of procedure. But the nice thing about that then is that because it's kind of delicate, you can resolve, <laughs> you can answer it effectively or to find a way to, to say that this is a valid approximation for X with some experimental system. So for the, the first thing is that, okay, so say I have some system that's creating gravitational radiation and it loses some energy and it loses some angular momentum. So let's first talk about the energy part of it. If I have two detectors like sitting very far away, so I imagine that I'm in like the radiation zone say of, of, of this, this scattering process, my test masses, rather than getting a kick for the electromagnetic case, are going to basically be moved apart. And so this story of asymptotic symmetries is somehow the statement that the coordinate choice that I made, the ambiguity in that is of like the same order in 1 over r and of a similar form to the shift that dynamically gets induced by the fact that there was gravitational radiation uh, passing through my detector. So. It, especially in 4D in particular, it, they're at the same order in 1 over R. And so you see this symplectic pairing between these symmetry modes and the memory modes. And these guys are constrained to be uh, related to the ingoing and outgoing kinematics of your scattering process. But um, and in this part, the, these two together form an interesting um, sector of your phase space. Now, if I go to the next example, which is angular momentum flux, what I have is the following fun picture. So I, um, if I look at the night sky, normally what would happen is if I do a Lorentz transformation, it's kind of like you're like boosting towards, you see this headlight effect and like the stars will uh, move around uh, like towards say the direction that you're, you're boosting. Um, and when, when you see that, it's not, um, it's not like a rotation or isometry of the sphere, it's a conformal transformation of the sphere. So the Lorentz group in, in, in three plus one is giving you conformal transformations. So basically the, the metric gets rescaled, on, on this night sky. So what I, if you, if you go and you measure this uh, analog of um, like angular momentum flux through detector, it's a signal of the fact that you have um, a new memory effect called spin memory. 
And the way that this detector would measure it is basically it would normally cause a rotation. It's like a sag neck effect that you in practice would measure. And the symmetry that it corresponds to would be one that would let you independently boost and rotate different patches of the night sky. So on the one hand, that's um, like from a astrophysical point of view, you can kind of see how you would go about and detect um, this angular momentum flux, which is, which is paired with the symmetry. And then from a practical, maybe like pheno point of view, uh, the symmetry itself would be interesting perhaps to study jet physics because essentially you have scattering in different directions and then some freedom for um, for how you choose to parameterize the like the the fields in the given jet direction. So there is like it's so in some sense you're seeing like these astrophysical and then phenomenological um, like I guess touchstones to motivate what you're doing. And then for the person interested in quantum gravity, then it's the fact that I have these symmetries that I can then impose as constraints on my system. So with one thing I want to point out before moving on to what this memory is leading to is the following. So again, the experiments, the part of the, the art is to find an experiment that is basically sensitive to these zero modes and basically can uh, get rid of as much as possible um, other zero modes that might be pre-leading. So in this case, you have a ring geometry so that you can remove the leading memory effect. Um, and then also um, you have to think about the fact that normally you might say like, so one argument for why infrared um, physics somehow, like one point of view would be that I can't really measure photons below a certain energy or gravitons below a certain energy. We're at the stage where it's like photons would be the thing you can't measure below a certain energy. So instead of trying to design observables that say, like you have a detector, which then like, causes some cascader and signaling the fact that I like felt some energy deposition in my detector. I, you just have to design a different type of detector to, to see the zero modes. So you can, but these are more like the masses get displaced. So rather than having mirrors that like basically come back together, you kind of somehow either have to infer or let your system move. So, so these are different types of measurements, but they are measurable, at least that like the approximation of like, instead of infinite time that like, you put a cutoff. But for, for some given range, effectively, you can, you can measure these zero modes, and they are intimately tied with the, the, the asymptotic symmetries of your system because basically they're changing, um, they're changing degrees of freedom that would like almost be pure gauge. Okay, so the statement that I want to make is the following. I have now, um, the, 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 the claim that I'm making is that basically if I started from quantum field theory, and I started to couple it perturbatively to, to gravity, then I, there is some soft theorem, some factorization theorem where this amplitude with an extra graviton is related to or proportional to the one without it. And that statement within quantum field theory that I can compute is then equal to a statement of an asymptotic symmetry's ward identity. So let's just maybe take a second to see what this type of structure would be, is I have an amplitude with an extra particle is proportional to the amplitude without it. So you see that the symmetry transformation is not just, um, say, boosting each of the hard particles, it's also adding in radiation. So the fact that um, the S matrix element realizes these symmetries in a somewhat non-trivial way by relating amplitudes with or without extra low energy particles is interesting. And then from the point of view of um, the charge conservation, basically the fact that the soft theorem takes the form it does is saying that there is this canonical charge for this asymptotic symmetry being preserved. So you have this equivalence, and this is a mathematical thing that you can check, um, starting from the soft theorem. So if you give me an amplitude, I find these symmetries by checking for these soft theorems. So what's in particular interesting is that this was a new soft theorem. So for instance, there had been some speculation. The, the, the first kind of point of view is that if I have global transformations, like global Lorentz transformations, then I have every point in the sphere is fine. If I start trying to promote in the same way that on a 2D CFT, I would have um, the possibility of having local conformal transformations. So I have like all holomorphic functions if in this complex plane. Um, I would end up adding punctures on the sphere. So if you were very averse to having um, something that wasn't globally well-defined, you might easily exclude it. So in the 60s, I think the original attitude was to, to, to not um, extend the rotational as part of the asymptotic symmetries and just have the analog of this energy deposition um, which would be a leading soft theorem. But in some sense, the, the, with people being more comfortable adding punctures and having some sort of strange singularities at points on this night sky, uh, you would, there was a kind of revival to reconsider that maybe it's possibly being added to the symmetry group. And the fun thing is then you can go to the amplitudes and you can go and check. So Cachazo and Strominger found a new soft theorem based on the fact that they expected it to be there in some sense. So you kind of see where um, 
the fact that you have this connection between these two ideas can lead to something new. So the something new here is this new subleading soft theorem. And then on top of that, because of the, the, this triangle of relations, the way that you would go out and measure the spin memory is also new. So basically each of these examples was either like just barely being considered again recently and then motivated as, as being brand new. So that's one success already kind of package that in. Yay, we, we found some new symmetries and um, that's fun. New soft theorems, new symmetries, new memory effects, you can go out and test it, lovely. Now, what I want to say is that the, the power that these things have is kind of um, twofold. So on the one hand, this particular symmetry is going to point us in a direction where we want to change our basis for scattering, which will then say some fun stuff about maybe what will happen at very high energies. Like, can we constrain um, scattering in a way that we normally wouldn't try to do because we want to think of things as decoupling at different energy scales. But just from the point of view of like, like full stop, let's stop here. What have we got so far? We have uh, the following. So we've done this computation basically using the perturbation theory where we've treated quantum gravity as a field theory. Now, once you have these symmetries and you can see their origin in these, like basically the, these gauge symmetries and like you're pinning stuff down at the boundary, um, you can postulate that the symmetries will should hold in whatever full quantum theory of gravity. So whatever is going on with the geometry in the bulk, you still want to have these symmetries realized in your scattering. And so what you now have is because you have this infinite number of, of, of symmetries essentially coming from uh, the fact that there's this arbitrary angle dependence to this, these parameters that I have, um, and one way to picture that is if I have a charge that's boosted, its electric and magnetic field is no longer spherically symmetrical. Uh, so if I have a bunch of boosted charges in different directions, I can kind of build up an arbitrary angle dependence for, for that profile. And so, so like that angle dependence is somehow a, a nice intuitive way to think about the way that these symmetries are infinite dimensional. So like they're, instead of being one charge for the full, like one value for everything, there's a value per direction in the night sky. So uh, it's not as extreme as saying that energy is conserved at every direction. It's more that energy deposited in any direction has some soft radiation component kind of taking into account the fact that it isn't conserved like, going forward. Like, so like, um, so you have, you have this infinite number of constraints that you can then apply now to, to your system. So there's two things you can do with these constraints. First of all, you can understand that certain infrared divergences and in amplitudes are really consequences of the fact that these charges aren't conserved or essentially that you set up a scattering problem where you haven't taken into account that you need to have some radiation when you have accelerating charges. And the second example is once you have conserved charges, you can start adding more boundaries to your system. So you have a black hole with its horizon and maybe it evaporates. You can now say that these symmetries need to be obeyed by the full S matrix. So it needs to also, um, this, the, these charges need to be conserved in the presence of, of black hole um, creation and, and evaporation. And so you can already see that symmetries give you something powerful that you could then run off and, and try to apply to those interesting problems in physics. So that's where you're at at this stage. But what for the next part of the talk I want to go into is that um, you can kind of push further, further with this example that I talked about. So we already mentioned that this relation existed between very low energy soft theorems in quantum field theory, and the fact that there are some symmetry groups um, that have this like much larger, like like basically angle dependent versions of your translations and your rotations. Now, that structure of that ward identity proof actually rearranges itself nicely into what would look like um, a 2D ward identity on this night sky. So on the night sky, what I imagine having is now I have um, some, for every particle that I wanted to scatter, I have a point that where that operator is inserted somehow. And like building this map is what we want to do next. But essentially what happens is basically because of the way that the uh, soft theorems have pole structures, they're very reminiscent of word identities from like your 2D yellow book or whatever. So given that, um, you can basically be inspired by the fact that I want to try to make my S matrix uh, soft theorem, now that I interpret it as a systematic symmetry, look as much as possible like a 2D current. And when you try to do that, you do need to do a slight tweak of the scattering states that you're using. So for instance, the subleading soft graviton theorem is this symmetry for the super rotations, different boosts and rotations of different patches of the night sky. And what it would lead to then is a candidate stress tensor in this 2D CFT. So in some sense, that stress tensor is kind of like the like one of the fundamental starting points. You want to have local operators and you want to have a stress tensor. And this ward identity is basically formulated so that it looks like the very low energy graviton mode gives a stress tensor and that the other particles that you're scattering are essentially points where uh, on the night sky because that's the direction of the momenta, say. So this is a simplified version of it, but this is our map. 
And that part two. So that, what I was just saying is you have your instates and you have your outstates, and those are labeled by um, initial and final momenta. And so they have a direction, they have a magnitude. So somehow I want to put that all into different operator insertions on the celestial sphere and try to write an equivalence between this S matrix in some basis and a conformal correlator in this 2D celestial CFT. So let's see how we would go about doing that. So what I have right now is I have my interactions might be some complicated thing, but at the early and final stages, I have these on-shell particles. So if I'm on shell, basically now I have um, the, my momenta is confined to be on this hyperboloid or light cone, if this is zero, of um, basically instead of four momenta, now I have only three coordinates. And so if I'm in the massless case, which is the one that's easiest to, to kind of visualize, I have a direction which is pointing and an energy scale for those guys. Now, somehow I want to translate that over into um, something where these operators are defined in terms of uh, conformal dimensions and, and J spins. So let's put a little bit more time into saying what these things are. So first of all, if I have this plus or minus sign, because I actually have two distinct things, like when I'm talking about scattering, I might've talked about the night sky, but if I'm looking at the night sky, I'm basically looking at past um, what would be called null infinity. So I'm looking at light rays that come to me from the past, but I can also think about turning on a flashlight and where those guys would go. So in some sense, there are two kind of spheres at the limits of my light cone. And so that sphere, that we think of as being at infinity um, is going to be our celestial sphere. And we're gonna add a plus or minus label for the in and out guys and map all of it to uh, operators on the celestial sphere. And so one other thing to keep in mind is that this is me at one point, but of course I could think about radiation that was emitted earlier or later. And so there is one extra coordinate, but that's fine. We already expect that. So right now our energies are not just a direction in the night sky. So I've drawn a circle, but it should be an S2 but also an energy. So what I'm trading out now is that energy for a weight. So essentially, the nice thing about the massless case is that I'm almost ready to go. I have my S matrix element, and all I'm gonna do is somehow integrate the energies with some kernel so that I turn it into something that transforms like a conformal correlator. So again, to, 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 to I guess I'm pin this thing down, these guys are eigenvalues, eigenstates of translations, and the delta and J would be, uh, if I take that a point where the operator is and I boost towards it or rotate around it. And the form of the subleading soft theorem is such that if those guys are diagonalized, then it really does look like um, a stress tensor ward identity in this field theory with conformal symmetry. So, so this is the map that is the, the basis of celestial holography. And so here's what we would do. Like literally to do this map to, to take us to these correlators, it's just called a Mellon transform. So you have these energies from the external particles. You plug in either the, the plane wave, if you want to look at the wave functions, you can plug in amplitudes directly or parts of amplitudes. And doing this integral transform will give you some result that is guaranteed. Um, basically, you can, you, can, you can trace down the symmetries to transform like this conformal correlator. And so what I want to emphasize now is, I guess, like two things that are, could be conceived as bugs, but they're um, more likely features, and that's the following. So first, we know we've set things up so that the Lorentz transformations are preferred rather than these translations eigenstates. So that could be an issue because translation invariance <laughs> includes time translation invariance, and we talk about like evolving our state from early time to late time. The second thing is that by doing this integral transform, we're really looking at energy scales um, all the way from zero to infinity. So from the point of view of someone studying an effective field theory, that's interesting because, okay, so this object is going to be probing something that I maybe don't know how to describe. And that could be a bad thing if I wanna say, I wanna actually evaluate this, this object. But if instead I say, I want to find consistency conditions for this object, it could be possibly powerful because you might be able to say something about how it has to behave in the UV so that these integrals converge. And so I think one thing that um, maybe what like has been, been appreciated more over time is, okay, so the first one is you get, it's, it's not a, a, it's more of an exotic conformal field theory, but definitely it's designed to transform obviously under Lorentz transformations, but you also now have your Soro. So you have these extended symmetry algebras. And what you get is you have um, for translations because they're not, they're not put front and center. Instead you have these interesting weight shifting symmetries. So there's this uh, kind of interesting algebraic structure that you can go and play with, with these so-called celestial amplitudes. And the other thing that you have is because you're probing all energy scales, it's fun that you can actually see that stringy effects will make this integral well behaved in the UV, and so it actually converges. So, from the point of view of maybe trying, like you could try to say, find the right 
um, like try to define the weights to shift them around so that you make the interval well behaved. But it's kind of fun that somehow if you try to say, no, I want to have um, a certain spectrum of weights, this interval should converge. That actually says something then about um, how the amplitude has to behave at high energy, say. So, so the, the fun thing is by turning out the, turning these bugs on their head, you can hopefully start seeing how you can um, say something interesting about amplitudes that you maybe would not think you would want to have the power or have the power to say just for momentum space. So that's a fun upside. So now the, the way that this framework is set up is the following. So you want to look for um, basically generic features of amplitudes in the spaces and then try to find natural constraints. So we now have this amplitude as a function instead of energies and directions. Uh, it's, it, now it's directions in the night sky. So these local operators are sitting in places and then a weight that we want the data on the principal series. So the weight is on some line in, in this complex plane but the behavior in that complex plane is basically governing what's happening at different soft limits or what's happening um, at very high energies. So you, you get to basically rephrase fun things that you might know from scattering, uh, the scattering amplitudes program into um, what's happening uh, in this new basis. So that's, I guess, technically like fun to just get your hands dirty and, and play with, like, like how well do you understand certain, certain features of scattering. Um, and then the, the next aspect of it is that you basically want to try to re push this 2D, 4D dictionary. So, so I guess the first thing I'm saying is that like you first want to make sure that you can perform this transformation. You know what these amplitudes look like. There's some um, extra constraints from the translation symmetries, et cetera. It doesn't look like quite like a normal CFT, but now you have a new um, space to try to find natural constraints, which might be unnatural from the normal momentum space point of view. Um, and when in building this dictionary, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, I can take an op a, a point particle with a given, like, so an in-state with a given momentum, do a Mellon transform and say that I have now this operator with a given weight and a given spin, which is equal to its velocity. Now, instead, I really want to understand, I guess, what's happening when I continue off the complex, uh, off the principal series, so different values of dimensions, what's happening there. I want to understand um, what happens when I take operators collinear. And this is where you start to see the original goal of this program, which is that you can have this um, interface between the toolkits from the amplitudes program and from um, conformal field theory. So on the one hand, you have soft theorems in amplitudes. So the soft factorizations are giving you currents in this, in this conformal field theory. And then the collinear limits of the particles are governed by operator product expansions in the conformal field theory. So while this might be a little bit technical regarding depending on the audience, um, essentially like you, you start building a map not just between, yes, I can do this integral transformation of this full object, but instead I can start interpreting different aspects of, of the amplitudes in this language and then looking the other way too. So there's a lot of nice features of 2D CFTs that one would try to find a interpretation for amplitudes in the spaces. So, so going both ways is quite important. Um, so one thing just to quickly point out some features that are already nice about this is that um, for Normally what would happen is the soft theorem would be different powers of the energy as the energy goes to zero. And in the complex delta plane, they get resolved to different poles at separated values of delta. So you can already kind of see um, like a nice feature where you're basically kind of distinguishing the different soft theorems from one another uh, in the spaces. Another nice thing about it is if you try to go to uh, recursion relations, these symmetries are actually strong enough to give you um, in the collinear limit um, recursion relations for those operator product expansions. So you, it's already, there's a nice example of an application of symmetries to, um, to kind of solving what's happening in collinear limits of amplitudes. So, so already I think that it's starting to turn around from can I do a map versus to like, can I use the algebraic power that I have in this framework with these symmetries to say something about amplitudes. And sometimes you already know that, but the hope is that you can push it further so that it's, you learn something new about amplitudes. So, Here's the path forward. So the first stage, there's basically two kind of parallel paths one wants to follow. The first thing one would want to do is to complete this dictionary and then involve various things. So we know various things about conformal field theories and we want to see how they're encoded in these amplitudes. We know various features of amplitudes. How are they encoded in celestial conformal field theories? And then can we set up a classification program? And that would be difficult. I mean, it would eventually be equivalent to classifying the, like the, the, the S matrix already. So it might not be something, um, the, like the, the, the key thing would be to find some key examples or some canonical examples. Maybe it's the like canonical example for the conformally soft sector, like the low energy physics is described by some effective degrees of freedom um, 
like some like Chern Simon's theory or like and then WCW model or whatnot. So you, you want to find some examples where you can um, understand the dual duality on both sides. And that should give you something, I think no matter what in IR and the IR side of things, I think that should be doable relatively soon. And so that should be fun to play with. The second path forward, which is also something that it seems ripe to, to be uh, looking at right now, is to connect to other subfields. So at the bottom of the list, I mentioned some of the things that um, one, could, one could be interested in. So for instance, the fact that um, these rotations are letting you boost different jet directions independently could be interesting for jet phenomenology. And also the way that these um, the, the transforms that you're doing kind of appear in some um, conformal collider um, work that's been tied into Fino you know, recently. Um, that would be fun to explore. The fact that you can go out and measure um, these memory effects and determine whether or not your symmetries are physical, like the, there's an interplay with, with this gravitational wave astronomy. Um, the fact that these symmetries can constrain um, black hole evaporation and tie into quantum information theory. The fact that we want to set up these, um, these um, consistency conditions and like try to um, push forward the, from symmetries, like, like solving for consistent amplitudes would be a very bootstrappy thing to do. And of course, um, in some sense, this is a rewriting or recasting of Amplitude's program in a new basis. So that's an obvious thing to try to connect more directly to, like the, 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 the fun things of the day in that field. So that, those are the paths forward. And now let's go back to our original quest and see how we've been doing as far as did we at least hint at or kid at what we were promising we were going to try to do. So the first question, of course, is what are the fundamental laws obeyed by nature? And what we've seen is that we have this pattern of relations in the low energy infrared sector that lets us help uh, identify new symmetries of our theory. And that not only do you have these new symmetries, but you have an infinite number of them. So because of that, you basically now have very um, many constraints that will constrain scattering and also constrain black hole creation and uh, evaporation. And then finally, what will happen at energy scales we can't get probe? Well, we've seen that this framework with these symmetries, especially the particular spin memory and super rotation in the night sky symmetry, pointed us towards wanting to change the basis where we're looking at scattering at all energy scales. So essentially, at least you can see how this, this, this setup has kind of touched on all of these interesting questions. And of course, it's possibly more interesting to like push each of them further and tie into uh, other efforts looking at these questions as well. So that is um, what I said we set out to do. Thank you guys very much. And I'm happy to take any questions. All right. Uh, thank you so much, Sabrina, for inspiring our talk. Let's give Sabrina a round of applause. Uh, and uh, now let's, uh, uh, we have time for questions. Please raise your hand. And I'm going to use my privilege of having a microphone to especially encourage uh, students. I see a lot of students on the line, so please. Please don't be shy, please ask questions. Okay, I see Jim has a question, please. Thank you, Anastasia. I have to run shortly. Uh, congratulations to Sabrina, a great talk. I have one, uh, just one basic question. Uh, the, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful program that you've laid out and uh, I'm, I'm trying to assess the state of um, how, what sort of modifications are necessary if you look at particles of different spins? Has that, has that been uh, covered so far? Okay, so so when when you say different spins, are you thinking like higher spin theories? Or are you thinking um, like so we so for instance that actually it's quite easy to do the different massless spin cases because it ends up being just a Mellon transform. So what happens when you go to like like photons or gravitons, etc., is that you're always end up being gauge equivalent to the guy that's just Mellon transforming the amplitude with the given spin. Um, is that what you meant, or what? Like maybe, yeah. No, that, that is what I meant, but I also want to make sure that it covers half integer spin. Yes, yes, it definitely does. So the the thing there is like the wave functions have some weird branch cuts, I guess, like um, which maybe are fun to think about. But definitely, you can you can write down um, like like you can write down these like super uh, like uh, there hasn't been too much in it. Normal n equals one uh, in a paper by Taylor recently, um, and then uh, also you can just write down the, the fermionic like the wave functions for it. Um, so, so all of that does follow through. I think there are probably some nice, maybe subtleties to think about with like the fact that you have square roots of like Q dot X, but you also have these weird like powers <laughs> to like, like Q dot X to some weird like lambda in a priori. So, so there's some there, um, but yes. So actively we're looking at, um, you can show that basically there's certain, um, certain values of Delta become um, 
pure gauge even for like say the gravitino field. So that's an upcoming thing that we're playing with um, just to show that essentially like maybe like this, you get soft theorems even for the fermion cases. So the, the, even like the whole story goes through even in, in the fermionic cases. Oh, okay. thank nice. you very much. Yeah. I've got to run very soft again, yeah. bye-bye. Bye. More questions, Changi. Okay, this is a very nice talk, thank you. I have a question which actually has two parts. Yeah. Uh, the first part is you have focused on discussing four dimensional theory. Yes. What if we have a higher dimension or lower dimension? Yeah. So for, oh. in, for instance, if you go to some higher dimension, then you said uh, flat space, no, no graviton, can you then add one more dimension to associate with theory with graviton? Conversely, right. if you go to lower dimension, suppose we, we have a three dimensional field theory, uh, can you make a lot of good statement about how it relates to a four-dimensional uh, theory with gravity? Okay, so, so I would say that I, okay, so, so there, the, I'll first answer the question the way that maybe I would want to answer it, and then I'll go back to, I guess, the question of, of um, one being within like the other. So, mm -hmm. so for, for me, the, the things that's, that look the least, so like the first part of the talk or the part that I kind of emphasize the most looks maybe like the most, Goldilocksy with respect to being in 4D. And the reasons for that are that you have, first of all, you have radiation. And then you also have the fact that the um, memory effects are at the same order as the uh, radiative, like, so essentially the, the radiation will shift your metric around at the same order that the symmetry is. And that's special to 4D. But regardless, you do have soft theorems in higher D. Mm -hmm. And what you have in higher D for the other soft theorems, essentially, instead of having, um, so the global conformal transformations don't get extended to local conformal transformations, but you have instead uh, basically null state conditions for different values of the conformal dimension. So there is an analog of the uh, symmetry algebra, or at least the, the symmetries you should get at special conformal dimensions that should persist to higher D, mm -hmm. where you don't necessarily have it phrased in the way that you have these uh, enhancements of uh, like to, to these like holomorphic currents, mm -hmm. say on, on the celestial sphere. When you go down, if you go lower to lower dimensions, it's less obvious that you would have um, these soft theorem type things because you don't have radiative modes. But what you do have is you should have these um, like in the same. So what so what's happening in the soft sector for us is that you have these like um, Goldstone modes uh, that correspond to like the is somehow like these special diffeomorphisms that are like still in in your in your gauge fixing like left there is residual diffeomorphisms. So you should still have those guys in the in in the lower dimensional examples. So I think like I think a couple of years ago we might be more confused about how to go to lower D and how to go to higher D. First of all, because we have these soft theorems that we don't see the enhancement, and we have um, everything relying on soft theorems. But now I think we started to see like you really should be able to do those both both of those things. So in the lower dimensional example, you're going to have these effective like edge degrees of freedom. Like some like the I think like the, you can imagine some sort of like diffeomorphism mode for for some um, for the boundary. And then in the higher D case, you have null states conditions instead of um, like enhancements to to local conformal symmetries. Like that's the analog. So that's the way I would answer the question. But I feel like you might have been asking a slightly different question if you're talking about um, like going up in dimensions, or can you rephrase it if there was something I didn't address? Well, uh, it's uh, that's a separate question from the going up to going down. Uh, we can talk about going up maybe privately. Yeah. Uh, go going down, I was wondering, can you see any hint of possible uh, provide hints on solving three dimensional 3D icing model? So, okay, so I wouldn't. Okay, so I want to say that I don't want to claim that right now because our CFTs are so weird. Um, <laughs> like, like it's a special thing. I, I, I want the CFT to fit me and not the other way around right now. Um, okay. I mean, maybe like, so I, honestly, I think if I wanted to answer that type of question, I would try to not restrict myself to having a 4D aesthetically flat space time dual, right? Like I imagine that there are probably other examples of like, like, uh, like ADS CFT that might be like, have be a candidate for that. So. Um, I would say that by being celestial holography, I am in a certain class of CFTs, and I don't know exactly what that class is, and that's part of the problem. I need to make sure I, I like pin that down. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, next, uh, Batya. I just have a really quick Hi. question. Um, where can I find uh, your, uh, if you have like a paper out on this? Oh, or sure. I yeah, I think the post, so we all go on Inspire Hub. I think uh, like my, 
thesis, which would be called implications of super rotations, would be relatively clean. As far as like the content that's here, it's mostly there. Um, and then uh, Andy also has some wonderful lecture notes. I mean, they published for a book, so like had a couple of people reading through it and, and, and adding uh, equations. And those are like lectures in the infrared structure of gauge theory and gravity and by, by Stromanger. I would say that those two are, are good resources for, for like the first part of the talk and then the, like the same. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, next we have Alex. Hi, uh, thank you so much. Um, so one question I had that uh, might be kind of trivial or it might not be, I, I can't really tell um, is, so it seems like um, one assumption is that we have linearity when we flow to the infrared. Um, yeah. uh, right, so what about subleading contributions? So, okay, I would say that we're still somehow, like the, I, I would say that the, the, in some sense, we're still pinning down at the boundary, like that it becomes free. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so definitely we, we should be able to, like, if once you go in from the boundary, like you should be able to kind of somehow think of maybe that as, as, as somehow not like, how do I say, we, we definitely are somehow in the asymptotic limit probing something that looks like almost like some symmetries of the fact that theory is like free in the infrared and, the, and the, that's how you're getting these angle dependence. Uh, um, like charges or, or whatnot. Um, I would say that I um, I don't yet know how to think about like moving into the bulk as somehow like some sort of RG thing like you might have in, in the ADS CFT context. But they're probably like what I would want to understand is somehow the connection between what we're I'm talking about here and if you had a finite causal diamond because there it would matter and you wouldn't expect to be free but you still have edge modes but maybe you have more complicated ones and there's more things you have to like like solder together um, across like those boundaries. So um, so yeah, so I, I mean, so so the, the other thing to point out too is that basically when you have, um, so I guess this isn't quite the, the issue of superposition, but where you have um, the corrections to these asymptotic trajectories, they will mess with the soft theorem. So you get corrections to the soft theorems. And I think that in our case, it changes like the residue of the poles a little bit by like, a, like it makes them a double pole or something. So, um, yeah, so basically I can, we can take into account these interaction effects, but the, the, the fact that it's not, like, so the, in that sense, it's not quite like the free theory or the, the simplest example. Uh, I don't know if I've quite answered your question enough, but um, it's definitely not a trivial question. Thank you. Next we have Stefan. Um, hi, Sabrina. Hi. Thanks for this wonderful talk. Um, you're gonna be a great teacher. Um, so my question is deliberately speculative. I have two speculative questions. The first is, um, so in the, you know, in the gravity case where you um, lamb asymptotically lambda is zero and, you know, the fact that you get these enhanced symmetries, can we turn the question around? So this is speculation mm -hmm. and maybe ask about the UV part of the cosmological constant problem. Maybe that whatever the theory is that's doing it actually what tells you that the lambda, when I include all these quantum correction lambda should be zero. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I think I, I wouldn't know how to say that yet, but I do think that you should, it would be nice to be able to tie this stuff into Swamplandy things. I mean, in some sense, I think it's of it is like the opposite or it wants to be the opposite of a Swampland type thing where you want to see that the only thing you can get that's consistent from doing this transform is, is, is like stringy in some sort. Um, so if that were the case, and that would be lovely to try to show that it's like the flip of it. Um, then I guess, yes, if like, like Cameron seems to say- That'll be a big deal. Do, but I don't think I want to say that yet, that I know right. anyway how to do that at all. But you're, 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 you'll, you'll be um, ambitiously thinking that way, you know? Um, I'd definitely be ambitiously thinking to connect it to reverse swampland, I guess. But, mm -hmm. and, but, but I mean, so like basically my ambition is to like try to connect it to as many cool things as possible so I can like basically take their gold. You know, like. mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. So next we have Luke. Thank you for the great talk. Um, you referred to the uh, translation operators as exhibiting a shift symmetry. Yes. Um, however, it, the translation operators are knocking us off of the principal series. And so seemingly yes. there's no unitary in a, in a product on our space. I feel like there's a paper from two days ago that I don't know, I don't think you're on it, but I, <laughs> I, uh, or yesterday, maybe even like, yeah. Um, so, so yeah, so I think, so I want to point out that like, yes, these guys are highest weight representations with non unitary like dimensions. So I know they, I still, the, the sense in which you, I, I believe that it's still solid to say that the, the data, the scattering amplitude 
like for all of the particles on the principal series is enough to analytically continuate off of it and that you really need the behavior in the full complex plane to, to capture the full like representation of Poincaré. So like I agree with on that. I think it would be fascinating to explore more the, the recent paper that was um, out by David Lowe and collaborator um, just in the sense that like so the, the, the way that the, we're transforming those, those wave functions aren't just designed to be like nice representations of SL2C, they're designed to be the ones that you'd get from these, like the, the, the subleading soft theorem. So I guess one thing would be to check whether or not the, the action of the super rotation generators, like, like basically how to assign a reference direction, because I, maybe I, I looked at it too quickly to see, to see where, where uh, that was. Um, but like, in some sense, like I, we welcome like different choices for the wave functions, but we basically want to know how to, to translate the amplitudes into it and the motivation for going to that aside from, I guess, the, this, this decider motivation. Um, so, so yeah, so <laughs> I feel like you probably were leading into that, <laughs> that paper in particular, so I brought it up. But um, yeah, for me, I'm just thinking like this, there's this a bunch of like relations between shifting and the dimension in the complex plane that give you more algebraic constraints and that's slightly in that's interesting because I don't want to, I don't want to give up these conformal soft theorems <laughs> because they're nice null state conditions and stuff that are off the principal series. And so, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. So next we have Daniel. Hi, Sabrina. Uh, thanks for the thanks for the great talk. Um, I just have a question. Um, so you mentioned um, uh, helicity in passing, and yes. uh, it just got me thinking because you were also talking about uh, uh, Nutter's theorem, and you were also focusing a lot on the uh, you, or you also talked about the, the massless case. And my understanding is that uh, in the massless case, um, helicity is uh, is conserved, but in the in the massive case, when you start including mass, um, helicity is no longer conserved. So, like, my question is, uh, in this in this framework, how do you use Nutter's theorem uh, to derive the conserved quantities? And I guess what what is or what are the conserved quantities? In massive? Maybe so. I want to separate it out into two different things. So, in the one hand, you're always going to have total angular momentum conservation, and when you have particles like like there's like mass maximally helicity violating or whatever, like. The, the individual particles can exchange like their spin for orbital angular momentum, right? So like the whole process should 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 obey like the conservation of angular momentum. Um, but what is interesting and in which I guess I think you're also touching on is that when I'm massless, essentially the helicity of the particle in, in 4D turns directly into the, um, the spin of the wave function in 2D when I do the Mellon transform. So basically if I do a rotation, like it's, I go to like the frame where the particles in the reference direction and then I like do a little group transformation. Um, that eigenvalue becomes the same one um, for this, this 2D operator. Um, and then if I smear it, there's ways to smear these wave functions and I can basically flip the sign of it. Um, now, if I'm massive, I, it's not necessarily guaranteed that the, uh, the spin of the particle is the same as the 2D J that's appearing. Basically you can get like modes of J that are like less than the, the total spin. And what's fun is that actually for the gravitational case and the mass cases, there are interpretations of modes that aren't radiative that basically are related to like Eichelberg sex, like some boosted black hole geometries or um, uh, like other um, basically like either configurations that are like SL2C descendants of the radiative guys or parents of them. Um, so the, I, I change your question around because I think that's maybe what you're going for, but like you, you should still have total angular momentum conservation. You should still have like some like, super rotation analog. Um, and there, basically, what I what I want is that I've created a wave packet so that there's a, um, a spin. Now, I assume that if everything works out with the massive spinning case, that basically the ward identities work out with the massive guys, but with now the 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 J, which may or may not equal to S, might be less than S for the particular state I'm looking at, for instance. But there should still be a, a ward identity for it. Akshay. Hi, um, thank you for a great talk. Um, so I had a, a, a simple question. Um, for massless particles, we yeah. could think of this, uh, we have a celestial conformal field theory living at null infinity. Uh, but naively for massive particles, we would think that there, there needs to be a theory at time like infinity. Is that true or is that related to the Yes, yes. So, so yeah. I, sorry, I avoided power diagrams just in case I didn't want to lose the audience. But now I'm glad, actually I'm really glad that you guys know already. So I don't need to, to draw something on the air. You know what? Okay. So yes. So, so what what happens is the following: is that um, in one approximation, 
Okay, so so I actually think that this would be interesting to understand how to connect. Um, wait, I'm gonna. So so yes, you have massive particles that exit at time like infinity, and basically you can Green's function either in momentum space or even on that asymptotic hyperboloid to the boundary. So you're basically preparing states that always look like they're somehow like peaked at a point on the boundary because you can basically boost ultra boost them in some sense. So artificially we can make something look like it's on this S2. Mm -hmm. but of course, then like the, uh, like the reference direction is kind of somewhat artificial because it's labeling the, the way that I've decided to boost the state and the dimension there is kind of, is, is there instead of the, the parameter that would be, I guess, a radial coordinate somehow uh, away, from, away from that boosted point. So artificially we can make that happen. Now I do think that what you're saying is nice from the point of view of if I wanted to think about how um, you would, say go from some conformal field theory to S matrix elements in um, so like so in ADS going from ADS down to flat space, there's some nice constructions by um, I forget, let me think of this name. Um, Elliot Hajano and, and collaborators, where mm -hmm. you think about like these punctures and then I guess like the punctures go to the boundary to create the, the massless guys. And so there's a sense in which the like the saddle point approximation in the massless case says that you go to very large R and then I integrate over U. So I have these like light ray operators, but that's basically a substitute at a substitution for LS, the LSD formalism. So I can look at correlators of these light ray operators to talk about mass matrix elements. And if I wanted to do the massive guys, I would basically looking, be looking at operator insertions at uh, time like in, in future region past time like infinity. So mm -hmm. there's a very real sense in which I think it's natural to think about those boundaries as being the ones where the, the massive states are defined. But I think that I'm fine artificially pushing them to the celestial sphere in the same way that maybe I'm exchanging this, um, like this null coordinate for the the light ray operator for a dimension that's continuous. So I could, have, in principle, make it work. But maybe there's a nicer formulation where you take it more literally and don't try to make it harder for yourself or something. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have Constantinos. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, I think I missed something. I was curious how you uh, bypass Coleman Mandula theorem and you allow this infinite extension of the Poincare group. Mm -hmm. With string theory, we have infinite uh, degrees of freedom, or you have propagation of strings, which you have the topological Wesumino terms. But mm -hmm. what, what is the trick here that allows you to do that? So, in some senses, these are gauge symmetries. Like, so, I mean, like, the, the funny thing about it all is just like, it's not. Like it, it's not the same thing as saying that there is like conservation law just amongst the um, just amongst the uh, the matter fields, for instance. Like I'm not changing my initial state, like all of like moving around each of the particles independently, and then saying that that's the same in the out state. I'm saying that there's some compensating soft factor that that's there. So in some sense, um, like the 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 funny thing about it is that like you gauge invariance is guaranteeing that these will be ho hold. But the I guess interesting thing is they act non-trivially on the S matrix with these soft theorems that are appearing. So in some sense, I would argue that like the, the I guess the loophole might be that this I, I, maybe me mechanically like these operators are, are like they they're not gauge invariant, and that's a part of it because I don't think there should be any reason why like for instance gauge symmetries are definitely allowed. The only thing we're doing now is we're attaching a physical meaning to the to some of them. Zuck. Are there more questions? Uh, Gang? Gang? Yeah, you have to unmute yourself, yeah. Yeah, hi, Sabrina. Uh, enjoy uh, your talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I get, I'm in condensed matter physics, and the only thing we share is uh, I'm interested in spin memory uh, hey. in, in solid state <laughs> physics. Yeah. That's your assistance. <laughs> Uh, so my question is, uh, in, I think, year uh, 2015, uh, you published a, a solo paper yes. and completed the PST, uh, uh, Pataski uh, Triangle uh, for the Electromagnetic Memory. Yes. Uh, so could you pretty, please put that paper in the context of today's talk? Uh, yes, of course. Yes. No. So, okay. So the, the thing that I was, I guess the example that I was looking at today, the, the beginning of it, like just to try to tie us things down, uh, was this electromagnetic case. And so there, the nice thing about that example is that somehow you can go back to your textbook, like electromagnetism, like, um, and kind of work through each of the examples. So the thing that's happening here is basically, um, 
because there's such a nice simple formula for the fact that I have this accelerating charge um, emitting radiation proportional to the acceleration and that the time integral is now this like delta V because like that, that aspect of it makes it quite simple to read off um, the fact that you would expect this memory effect to, to look like the soft theorem in momentum space basically. Um, so the ingredients that you just need are essentially the saddle point approximation where I identify the position space direction and the direction of the momentum for the guy. And then um, some classical EM for seeing that I expect the radiative fields to be that way. And then matching it onto the soft theorem. Now there's a little bit of a, a jump, which I appreciated like, the, like so it's, in some sense it's a, like, there's a, the fact that the, the probability distribution for the soft radiation is such that the probability of emitting is like the expectation value of observing in some sense. So things actively right now, I think we're thinking a little bit more about like, like, are we always looking at S matrix elements? Can we talk about in informalisms, et cetera, in the celestial sphere context? So that ingredient is something I think is still being appreciated in hindsight, but otherwise the ingredients in that paper are, are just those two. Thank you. Yeah. Great, next we have Li Cheng. Hi, so thanks for a nice talk. So maybe I have missed something that you have already talked about. And so the celestial CFT is a, we, we can understand it as a, uh, as a special kind of CFT. Yes. So based on the conformal symmetry on the celestial sphere. Yeah. So we should expect more symmetry that comes from the ball theory. So is there any uh, general result of this more symmetry or that should be specific for different kinds of fields in the bulk? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so sorry, sorry. I think I, I, sorry, I, I think I erred on the side of like, excluding too much detail, but I, like, let's, let's go through this. We can definitely go through this. So the, the thing when you have gravity in the bulk, you get not only a stress sensor, you also get this current that generates translations. Um, and so there's basically these two zero mode fields, at least, if not another subleading soft theorem, sub subleading soft theorem that are um, essentially governing um, the, like, there's some sort of restrictions or if you take descendants of them, they will give contact terms and those are sourced by like different uh, multiple moments of the matter. So in like, so the gravitational theory gives me a certain number of currents and electromagnetic theory would give me another certain number, like normally one um, Kitsmoody uh, symmetry say. So like in the non-abelian case, it's more interesting, perhaps there's like some gauge theory. Um, but basically what happens is for any spinning field, like so any massless field, um, the fact that these soft theorems somehow are um, like not measuring this, like they're, they're somehow like either less or there's something about the, um, for the leading case, it's the fact that like there's not two independent helicities, there's kind of only one um, mode there that you need to reduce the, the, the radiation guys down, there's some constraints. You, you'll, you can read off the, the, basically the dressing modes that you would need to add. So what I would say is that there are currents that you can define for any soft theorem and they're a finite number that basically is bounded by like, it scales like the spin. So if I had higher massless spin fields, I would have many, many more currents. Um, I have basically like two or three in gravity, one or two, depending on how you want to count the most subleading in EM, and down and so forth if I go to, to lower spin. So that, that's the way the structure works. Like if you tell me the spin, I can tell you the currents. Um, okay. Uh, Daniel, your hand is up from the last time, or do you have another question? Uh, no, my hand is still up. All right, All right let me just call, uh, uh, last call for a question. All right, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Sabrina again. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Thank you.